Welcome everyone to the very first episode of the new talk show Rendezvous with the Stalwarts. In this talk show, we'll be showcasing the journeys of the stalwarts around the world in our profession and discuss with them about their experiences, learnings and the projects that they have been a part of during their exceptional careers. I, Daniel Couture, will be serving as the host for the show. In today's episode of Rendezvous with the Stalwarts, it is truly a pleasure to be talking to Glenn Bell. Glenn retired from Simpson, Gumpertz and Hecker in January 2020 after 45 years working for them, 22 of which were as their CEO. He successfully completed his 2019-2020 term as the president of the ASC Structural Engineering Institute this week. He is a co-director of the Cross Us program and also a board member of the Charles Panko Foundation. Throughout his career, Glenn has had the design responsibility of a number of noteworthy ground-shaking structures and therefore has been the recipient of numerous distinguished awards as well. So without any further ado, let's dive in straight into our conversation with Glenn Bell. Welcome, Glenn, to the first episode of Rendezvous with the Stalwarts. Thank you so much for taking out time for the show today. Daniel, thank you for that kind introduction um, and congratulations on starting this series. I think it's a great idea. Good for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to our conversation today on the show. Glenn, I'd like to start by jogging your memory uh, during your growing years to know what it was that inspired or drew you towards pursuing a passion in civil engineering and then take a specialization in structural engineering. Sure, Daniel. Um, it was an interesting path. Um, mostly, I was very fortunate to have an inspiring figure and role model in my life, and that was my father. Okay. My dad was an electrical engineer, and he worked in the aerospace industry from the 1950s through the 1980s, uh, the early 90s when, when he retired. Um, yes. And he worked on some fantastic projects, uh, part of it during you know, the US space race. Okay. Um, he worked on rocketry and guidance systems, the Gemini and Apollo programs. So um, he was my hero and my role model and I always wanted to be an engineer like my, my dad. Okay. Um, I also just happened to be, I think, rather technically oriented. Um, I like taking things apart. I like building things. Um, in my teen years, I was really fascinated with auto mechanics and worked in an auto mechanic shop. So I think that was the technical orientation being expressed there. Um, okay. I had other interests as well. Um, I love music and art and sports. Um, I did a lot with uh, competitive sailboat racing in my youth, and I still do that today. Yeah. Um, but so I, I was, I think, destined to be an engineer. Uh, okay. In the late 1960s, however, the US space race was winding down after we had uh, landed a person on the moon. Okay. Um, yeah, and the yeah. aerospace industry was struggling a little bit. So, yes, um, yes. My dad, uh, the company that my dad was working for at the time kind of fell on hard times. Um, he had to change job a couple of times. There were long periods when he was actually without some employment. Um, and that, uh, watching him struggle with that, my dad, who was a hero and such a fabulous engineer, um, really had an impression on me. And this was about the time I was getting ready to enter college and uh, choosing a major. So okay. I really um, began to re-examine what branch of engineering that I wanted to be in, uh, yeah. reflecting on my dad's experience. Yes, yes. I yes. thought that um, civil engineering would be a branch that would probably be more stable, be yes, more sure. likely to serve well as sort of a long-term Term career opportunity, uh, not Definitely. so suspect to, to, to variations in funding and things like that. So, um, so I, I resolved to be uh, to, to start in civil engineering. I wasn't sure what branch first. Um, I thought it might be environmental, but 
Then along the line, I think it was in my sophomore year, um, I took a course um, that was about the relationship between architecture and structural engineering. And um, it was really kind of happenstance. It was an elective that happened to fit with my schedule. Um, but uh, it really resonated with me. And okay. our professor brought in practitioners um, from the Boston area. This was at Tufts University, where I was an undergraduate, um, in both architecture and structural engineering. And they talked about the projects that they worked on. And it was really yes. inspiring for me. And then and there, I made up my mind that I wanted to be a structural engineer. It was sort of um, not sure about architecture and structural for a while, and I still sort of bridge those interests, as okay. I think a lot of structural engineering engineers do, but um, I wound up in structural engineering and never looked back. That's an inspiring story, yeah. So like, like you already mentioned that you did your bachelor's from Tufts University. So yeah. where did you go for your master's in structural engineering? And was there any particular reason that you had in mind for visiting uh, that school? Yeah, uh, well, I'll, I'll start with Tufts too, because that might yes. be an interesting background, how yes. I selected that. It was kind of yeah. an unusual reason. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier that I was interested in my youth and my teens in, uh, in competitive sailboat racing. And it turned out at that time, and I intended to do that in college, and it turned out at that time that Tufts University had the top ranked sailing team in the nation. So I chose that school <laughs> because I wanted to sail and compete. I knew they had a good engineering program. I didn't know they had a great engineering program, but yeah. I chose Tufts principally to go and yeah. sail. It's, it was um, a win-win for you. It was really a win-win for me. Yeah, um, yeah. But in the engineering side of things, uh, the, the, the civil engineering faculty were great there at the time. Um, it was a great mix of academics and practitioners. Some of my best professors didn't have PhDs, but rather came out of practice and went to teach. So it was a wonderful experience. There also was at the university a, a generous liberal arts exposure. And uh, the, generally at Tufts, there was more emphasis on liberal arts and engineering in terms of the entire university. So yeah. I had the opportunity to get exposed to some great liberal arts courses, which I think have served me well. And looking yeah. back on it, actually, um, the selling experience was a great opportunity for me because um, you know, our coach um, was a former world champion in oh. his class. He was an inspirational leader. And I learned a lot in competing. We actually competed for the national championship in the years that I was there. That's great. So we learned about excellence and competition and leadership. So um, yeah. that turned out to be a great um, uh, personal and career, career opportunity. Yes. Um, yes, yes. So, uh, Berkeley, the choice of Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley, where I went for my graduate work, was a lot more straightforward and directed um, at the time, and I think still is. It was yes, the yes. top ranked program in the country, or yes. one of the top for structural engineering. Um, yeah. And I think the allure of California had something to do with it as well. Um, yeah. Growing up and going to undergraduate school, on the East Coast, I thought it would be interesting and exciting to try, you know, another place in the country. So it turned out to be fortuitous again that uh, my time at Berkeley, and this was in the mid 1970s, um, okay. many of the icons of structural engineering yes. were on the faculty. Yes, like yes. Clough and Vertelmo Bertero, Anil Chopra, Joe Penzine, yes, yes. Cordellis, these were yes. all on the faculty when I was there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I look back on that. I didn't realize at the time how amazing this group yes. was actually in the program yeah. was. Yes, yes. Berkeley consisted of like uh, you can say like the gods of structural engineering, like most of the authors of the textbooks, which all the universities like like I was in India. We used to use yeah. the same textbooks from A K Chopra yeah. and yeah. the other yeah. authors. So like that's right. That, yeah. that might have been a very good experience and learning for you at Berkeley. My first year there, uh, Clough and Penzine got together and they were about to publish their first book on dynamics. And Ray Clough taught the first uh, course I took in structural dynamics. And um, 
The book wasn't published yet, but we learned off of mimeographed uh, uh, galley prints of the of okay. the book that was about to come out. Yeah, that's good. Really that's great. good. Yeah, one of the issue like faced by newer generation of structural engineers has been uh, like in developing creativity and a proper understanding of the structural behavior. Mm -hmm. Like unlike earlier, the new codes and standards have now become so much complicated and uh, primitive, leading them to surrender to the computers as there's no way to satisfy so many equations manually anymore. So what are your suggestions to the younger generations uh, that will help them a clear understanding in the early stages of their career uh, rather than they being just a slave to the computer results that they are getting? Oh, that, that, that's such a great question because it, uh, it really goes to where our profession is headed, which I've been passionate yes. about for a long time, and uh, yes. what it's going to mean to be a great structural engineer in the future. Yes, uh, yes. I want to start by telling you a, a bit of a story about a course I took at Tufts in undergraduate, uh, and it was really about structural behavior. Um, and it was in our senior year. The name of the course was Advanced Structural Analysis. It was actually taught by uh, one of those professors I mentioned who was a practitioner who came back to teach. Yes. And uh, his name was Kentaro Satsumi, or we okay. called him KT. Um, KT taught us to have a healthy skepticism for computer results and to develop a very strong foundation in structural behavior. Yes. And the way he taught our course our senior year and I'll never forget his very first lecture to us seniors uh, started with a lecture about the fact that he knew a lot of us would be entering into the profession the next year and that we needed to learn right then and there how to get the right answer to a problem and get it right every time with a great deal of self-reliance. So um, he taught the course. Uh, to sort of mimic what a real world engineering experience might look like. But it was centered around the topic of advanced structural behavior. Okay. So the entire course was built on homework assignments. There were no exams, but there were homework assignments that involved structural analysis. And um, you were graded on how well you did on your homework assignments. He would give us a structural analysis problem um, and you either got, uh, got it all right, completely right, and got 100, or you okay. didn't get the right answer. And if you didn't get exactly the right answer, you got a zero. Oh. And Satsumi's point was that you had to get it right every time, and partial credit didn't count in the real world. It was a great lesson. Yes. And so the way he uh, required that we do the course was uh, we went through... Uh, textbook at the time was known as Norris and Wilbur. I don't think it's uh, it's it's a, a, in print anymore, mm -hmm. but it really was about the various classical methods of hand methods for structural engineering, uh, okay. structural analysis, portal frame method, moment distribution, conjugate beam method, virtual work, all of that yes. kind of stuff. Yes. And we would go through chapter by chapter. We would have to learn the method, yes. and then he said to us. Uh, Here's a homework assignment. Do this assignment by whatever the particular analysis method was at the day. And then uh, trot up the hill where the mainframe computer was and run the same program on a frame analysis program. Uh, there really wasn't much in the way of finite element analysis at the time. And um, if the two answers from your hand calc matched with the computer calc, you were pretty much sure you had the right answer. Yes. That was good. Hand the assignment in. And again, if you get it right, you get 100. If not, you get zero. Mm -hmm. um, and it taught us really very deeply how to do the hand methods well, but also a healthy skepticism about where things could go wrong with models. Yes. yes. And um, he was clever enough that he gave us some problems uh, that he knew were at risk of being ill-conditioned in the machine if you didn't do things right. Things that were uh, on the verge of being unstable or areas where there were 
uh, vast uh, differences in stiffness that could result yes. in numerical problems. Yes. And that course, um, and he loaded on the work. That course, which is a real life thing as well. And I remember, um, you know, all of that semester, I generally worked almost entirely on that course and every night until three or four in the morning. Um, and of course, then your, your grade was really about at the end of the semester, what percentage of all of these problems did you get right to 100%? Um, and that taught us uh, a very healthy understanding of the basics of structural behavior and where things could go wrong with the machine. Um, and I carried that forward um, and taught engineers at SGH to always, always, always uh, check computer results with hand calculations. Uh, it's a great way to learn about structural behavior. Yes. Or even the most complex problems, if you can't get within 20, 10, 20% of what the machine is telling you, um, you probably got a problem somewhere in the, in the uh, computer analysis. So um, my first um, advice to younger engineers is learn the hand methods well, verse yourself very well in structural behavior, and always uh, do hand checks in combination with uh, the structural analysis. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now that was, uh, there were two parts to your question. That, that was the structural behavior piece. Um, yes. You also touched on uh, conceptual design, the complexity of analysis and so forth. You're, you're absolutely correct in noting how codes have become overly prescriptive and overly yes. complex. Um, yes. When I started um, practicing, um, what is now known as ASCE 7 was ANSI A58.1. The very first version of that was the 71 version. I learned okay. on that. I, that. That document was about that thick. Oh, I'm, I'm not, not exaggerating about that thick. Today, ASCE 7, you know, is in yeah. two volumes. Yes. The main and the commentary, which are each a book about that thick. Yes. And it yes. tells you how complex things have become. Yes. And there are good and bad aspects of that. The science has advanced tremendously, but all of that prescription, all of that complexity has really kind of put us in a box and made yes. it very difficult for us to be creative. Um, and in some respects, too much of the work that we're called upon to do as structural engineers today Yes. Is using machines to solve these and satisfy these complex equations. Yes. Yeah. So you're trapped in this box. The opportunity for creativity is diminished. Um, yes. And it's tough. It's tough. Yes. Uh, so we're working a lot on this um, in in the profession, uh, trying to you know take back if you can the opportunity to be creative. Yes. One of the pushes in the profession now is for more performance-based design, yes. which has found itself very well into the seismic community. Yes. Um, and it's now working into wind and other hazards. It's working into fires and so forth. And yes. This allows us, as you know, to go back to first principles. Yes. And yes. Design yes. structures based on an expected or a target uh, performance level. And not be yes. confined to all of these codes. So I think that's I think that's great. Yes. Um, there's a lot one can do uh, to learn creativity. Um, there's a program at the University of Bath in the UK where I'm a visiting scholar, where the architects and the engineers work together for the first two or three years of the curriculum. Okay. So you're exposed to a lot of conceptual design, design development, and so forth. And uh, I think. Thinking a little bit more like architects sometimes is a, is a helpful way because I see our our work as structural engineers becoming more collaborative. Yes, yes. Architecture professions and others more holistically uh, uh, oriented. Um, but also, you know, I would encourage people to study broadly beyond non-technical issues. Um, get involved in things that. Um, require creativity like art and music yes and you'll get yes. exposed to the creative process um, mm. another really important aspect of, uh, of conceptual design is hand sketching 
You don't want to, in the structural concept stage, run to the computer too soon, but rather sketch things out. Um, yes. Explore different concepts um, and really try to get a you know, rough solution, conceptual solution to a problem uh, before you, you know, run to the, to the machine. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Those are very good, good points that you mentioned for like young engineers to like develop understanding of structural behavior and not become a slave of the computer results like right. from the early start of their career. Yeah. And, and uh, conceptual design and understanding um, uh, good structural behavior go hand in hand. They're cousins. Yes. So, uh, they help each other. Yeah, right. definitely, definitely. Along your career, Glenn, so how have you managed your overall development in terms of upskilling yourself technically and also mm -hmm. preparing yourself for a number of leadership roles? Like, did you have a vision and drive right from your early career to be a part of va various leadership roles that you have successfully held so far? Yeah, okay. Uh, another great question, and, and I'll, I'll take this chronologically, because obviously earlier in my career, it was about technical learning and yes. advancement. Um, yes. There was um, a pivotal couple of instances very early on in my career um, when I learned the importance of self-learning and self-reliance and taking ownership of your professional development, technical um, as well as professional skills. And one of my first experiences that I'll tell you about was um, I was assigned to be the project engineer for a fairly complex concrete structure, was one of my yeah. first. And I ran into a problem de de designing a flat slab structure, which was pre-stressed, by the way, at which uh, the, the slab column connections had quite a bit of torsion, and I didn't understand how to, you know, bring the moment into the column and get that the column moment into the slab and vice versa. Yes. Um, and so, uh, and it wasn't something that I learned how to do in school. Yeah. So I went to see my boss at the time and said, uh, you know, Jack, I, I don't know how to do this. They didn't teach us this in school. And he looked at me kind of sternly and he said, uh, what do you mean you don't know how to do that? Um, you're a, professional now. Uh, you came from a great school. You're supposed to be highly trained. Um, we expect you to know how to do these things. And he reached up on his bookshelf and he pulled down a textbook on concrete design and he handed it to me and he said, um, take this home tonight and tomorrow come in and tell me that you know how to do this. The problem that I couldn't solve. <laughs> And uh, I, I was really taken aback, you know. Uh, it, and it, this was a two-minute interchange yeah. that changed my life. Oh. Um, and I had another, another similar experience, um, maybe about a year later, where I was working on a forensic problem that involved a, a brittle fracture of a steel structure. And we were using, as a consultant on that project, um, an MIT professor who was an expert in fracture. And as I was working with him, um, he realized that um, I didn't know a lot about brutal fracture. He could tell by my qu the questions I was asking. And in one of our meetings, um, he brought me a textbook, uh, Rolf and Barsom, one of the very classics of that. And he said, uh, you know, you really need to learn about brutal fracture. It should be part of any engineer's education. I don't understand why you're not expert at this. Here, take this book home and read it. And he gave me the textbook. Those two experiences um, set me on a path of, as I mentioned earlier, always making each project part of my continuing education. Yes. And for most of that, it meant reading books, reading articles, nights and weekends, and making every project an opportunity to learn more and more and really assessing my state of knowledge and expertise. And I did that through my whole career. Um, yes. My engineering library today is huge. I was always buying new books, always reading more journals and so forth. And it was a lot of fun. It, to me, um, I learned so much more from the textbooks that way by integrating it with the work that I was doing on a daily basis than I did, frankly, with coursework at university.
Now, um, that's the technical side. Uh, the leadership side is has some similarities, but it's different in yes. other respects. Uh, to answer your question, did I ever envision being a company CEO? And the answer is absolutely not. I was <laughs> I was always a geeky engineer. I loved doing the calculations. Um, and if you had asked me when I started out in 1975, um, if I was ever interested in being a CEO or in any kind of a leadership position, I would have given you uh, an emphatic no. It's <laughs> not on my radar screen at all. Um, but circumstances sort of thrust it on me. Um, and the story behind that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, in the mid 90s at SGH, um, it was time to transition um, our CEO. And our, it was around 1992 or three that our then current CEO, Howard Simpson, um, said, you know, he called me into his office one day and he said, you know, Glenn, um, I'm going to be stepping down from this role in the not too distant future, maybe two, three years. And the board of directors has been thinking about who they, we think the next CEO of the firm should be. And, um, and we think it should be you. And I, and I was absolutely floored. <laughs> uh, and, and I think the reason was not that they, they looked to me was not so much that I had managerial training at the time that, that was obvious. But um, as I mentioned to you earlier, when we reviewed uh, my, my background and experience, yes. I had worked in many areas of the firm. Yes. And I had done practically, you know, in a technical sense, just about everything the firm had done at the time, structural engineering, forensics, supplied mechanics, building envelope work, that was pretty much the breadth of the scope of the firm. And so yes. the board thought that, um, that I knew the business of the firm very well. I also had the opportunity to build friendships and alliances in the firm as I worked in different places. And fortunately hadn't made any enemies anywhere in the company. And so, you know, I think they thought that I would be, uh, I would be an accepted leader of the firm. But I was, I was pretty young at the time. I was yes. um, in my, I was in my early forties um, and I had no management training. Okay. Um, uh, but I, I dove in um, and I made a success out of it. It was really scary. There were times when I thought that, um, boy, I'd made a big mistake, uh, that the, the, the burden seemed to be overwhelming, but um, I really, you know, put my shoulder to it. Um, I started, again, by doing a lot of reading. You know, the lessons that those mentors had taught me about self-learning and responsibility uh, were really important. And I bought tons of books on managing firms, managing people, leadership, et cetera. Um, and I also really got interesting, interested in, in, in reading biographies of great leaders in, okay. in engineering, maybe, but in all kinds of things, politics, yes. business, et cetera. Um, and today I have probably 20 feet of, uh, you know, bookshelf, <laughs> my home library, there are books on management and leadership and, uh, and biographies of leaders. So, so that was really helpful. Uh, the other thing I did uh, to develop as a leader, and this was kind of happenstance as well, but um, it turned out to be great for me. Uh, a couple of weeks after I took the role of CEO, I got a call from a management consultant Okay. He said that he had learned in uh, by reading industry news that I'd become the CEO of the firm and that I might want to consider joining um, a peer group of CEOs that he was developing and leading. Um, okay. A group that would get together once a month and share issues and concerns and learn from each other. Um, and when I asked him, you know, who the other members were, there wasn't a single other engineering leader in, in the group. Oh. Um, I really didn't think it was for me. And he convinced me to, to give it a try. He said, I think this would be good for you. Give it a try. No expense, no obligation. You know, come to three meetings. 
And if it's not for you, um, it's not for you, and that, that's fine. Um, so I joined this group. Um, there was one banker, bank president in the group. There was a leader of a human resources firm, a uh, technical startup guru who had started uh, three companies and sold them and made a fortune in that. There was a wall and ceiling drywaller contractor and a diamond merchant. I mean, this was the group. And I was the <laughs> other. And uh, we held our sessions once a month, sort yes. of fashioned after uh, uh, business school case studies. And the way it worked was um, each one of us in, uh, in sequence was uh, charged with bringing a problem that we had uh, from work uh, to the group and putting it before the group and asking for their advice. Okay. Um, we did that. And that turned out to be a fantastic experience uh, because um, the group was candid. Uh, they were really bright, yes. people, really experienced leaders, but they had much broader perspectives than um, I was exposed to within our industry. Yes. And that was, uh, that was 25 years ago that that group, uh, you know, was formed. And I have to say, although we don't meet as, uh, as a group of CEOs and presidents anymore, some of us, most of us are retired or have moved on yes. to something else. We've remained personal friends um, yeah. and still stay in touch. So that was a yeah. wonderful experience. Completely happenstance. Yes, um, yes. So I, you know, I, I would say... What I learned from this, the takeaway is you never know where your career is going to head. Yes. And you really have to think about seizing the opportunities that are presented to you um, and be willing to extend yourself and get pushed outside the comfort zone. There's no way yes. to predict where your career yes. is. Yes. Seize every opportunity that you get and make the most out of it. I tried. <laughs> that brings us to the end of our part one of our conversation. So in the second part, we'll be discussing with Glenn about the projects and challenges that he has worked on, followed by a very interesting segment at the end of the show. See you all in the part two of our conversation with Glenn Bell.